Well, fortunately for us um, film goers, um, Mockingjay, the novel has been divided into two films. And I yes. just wondered how that serves you um, as a filmmaker, maybe thematically in terms of tone. Uh, well, actually, I mean, the, the the biggest benefit for splitting a novel into two movies is you actually just get more of the novel in the movies. You know, it's always a trick when you're trying to whittle a 450-page novel down to two hours. There's a lot of loss. This allows us to have more movie. It also allows us to do some sort of world expansion. So there's always, you know, surprises even for the fans of the books. You know, you get something new within the movies themselves. And from the first moment we're going down in the elevator to District 13, I was really impressed by um, Philip Messina's um, production design. Um, striking different to what we've seen before and to the capital. What were your kind of guiding principles for the look of this subterranean world? Uh, well, for the look of District 13, I think, you know, most of the inspiration came from the source material. You know, Suzanne described 13 as a district that used to be a military district and it had uh, nuclear silos and graphite mines. And so we started by sort of re researching nuclear silos and graphite mines and then thinking about, uh, okay, well, this is a civilization that's lived underground for 75 years. What would that be like? And we looked at things like aircraft carriers and, you know, sort of uh, self-contained, you know, internal sort of living facilities and how they're laid out and how they work. And then we sort of actually drew out a whole schematic of what it would look like from above. So we could also get a sense of geography of where everything would exist. And we sort of built it all out from there. And when that craft is taking off, I mean, it looks, looks very real. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, what we did was we actually, for the hovercraft scenes, I wanted the hovercrafts to feel real as if they could be helicopters in a movie you would make today. Um, and so we actually built a set that the, that the actors could go inside and out of that we would put on a crane. Um, and we could lift it up and, up and down and had these big fans to sort of kick up dust and all that. So it actually felt to the actors like they were really landing in a hovercraft and could get in and it would take off and they could run away. And then we just kind of digitally extended it um, to sort of build out what we couldn't afford to build on set. <laughs> and I know Julianne Moore was a fan of the previous films and, and the books and yep. sort of wanted to come on, on board. Um, what do you particularly admire about her as an actress and what she brought to President Coyne? Well, I've just, I've just been a fan of Julianne's for, you know, for a really long time. I just think she's a phenomenal actress. I mean, she's done so many different kinds of things. I mean, from comedies to dramas and period pieces and thrillers and um, she's phenomenal. So when I found out that she was interested in playing the part, I mean, it was a no-brainer for me. It was, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the fun thing is that um, be because we have room to sort of expand the books, we were expanding some of the coin character scenes. Um, she's a very important character in the books, but if you really take a look at them, there's very few scenes with her in it. And so we have more scenes with coin than the book does. Um, so there was some character development needed, but she was on board earlier um, and early enough that she was actually part of the development process. And so we sort of incorporated some of her ideas and what she wanted to bring to President Coyne into the character in the script. And similarly with Effie, with the Elizabeth Banks character, mm -hmm. that's been very much expanded from the book, hasn't it? Yeah, well, you know, Effie actually wasn't in 13 at all in the book. She, she makes an appearance at the very end, which would be the very, very end of Mockingjay Part 2. Um, and, you know, after going through the process of Catching Fire, you really see how Elizabeth especially has made Effie a really iconic part of these movies. Um, and we just all, quite honestly, couldn't imagine, you know, telling one of these stories and making one of these movies that didn't have Effie in it. Um, and so we, you know, spoke to Suzanne Collins, the author of the books, and, you know, convinced her that Effie needed to be in it. And, of course, when Suzanne had, had seen Catching Fire, she, you know, knew that there, there was no way we could make a movie without Effie. And what did you particularly admire about Jennifer Lawrence's commitment to the role of Katniss this time around in, in Mockingjay Part 1? You know, I mean, I just, you know, quite honestly, I just admire her as, as an actress in general. I mean, she just is Katniss Everdeen. I mean, I think it's almost impossible for anybody to imagine anybody else playing the part. Um, but she's also just a phenomenal actress. And, you know, I think we work really well together, I mean, as sort of the entire cast does. Um, and, uh, you know, she's just able to inhabit that role, and she's a very intuitive actress and very instinctive um, and very naturalistic, and I think she brings a, a realism and a naturalism and an honesty and a gravity to, to a role that I think um, people really love. Francis Lawrence, thanks very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from The Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey, you guys!